If you have your Bible this morning, turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 10, verse number 38. We're going to start reading with verse number 34, Acts chapter 10. We've got the Apostle Peter preaching again now. He does a lot of preaching. Acts chapter number 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Note carefully now verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was witness, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Amen. Father, I pray now that you'd bless your word as it goes forth. And this messenger, our Heavenly Father, as I try to preach it, give me what you'd have me say. I pray for unction, Lord, and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. In thy name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I believe the Bible that I preached to you this morning, folks. I believe the Bible. I think that should be evident to anyone. If you've heard me for any length of period of time, you know that you'll never hear me up here making excuses for the Scripture or trying to correct the Bible. I'll let the Bible correct me. That's enough right there. But the book of uh, Acts chapter number 10, the Apostle Peter Note carefully said that the Lord, what he did, he did it under the anointing, verse 38, of the Holy Ghost. He was anointed. The Christos, the Mashiach. It was the power of the Holy Spirit of God that the Lord Jesus Christ was able to perform every miracle that he performed. And believe me, he performed many of them. And if we can believe what the Apostle John said, and I believe every word that John said, he said that he did many more things that aren't even recorded in this book. If the world, he said, if we wrote all the books that would define and describe what he did, the world couldn't hold them. So the Lord Jesus Christ undoubtedly did much more than what we read in Scripture. But the Bible says these things are written that you might believe, and believing have everlasting life. So the Scripture says here that he was anointed. This anointing is so necessary. I don't think we preach enough on it. The power of the Holy Spirit of God is our very lifeblood. Without the Holy Ghost, we have no power. And without the Holy Spirit, we have no joy. And without the Holy Ghost, you can never be born again. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was sent. He said, it is necessary, it is expedient for you that I go away. And if I go away, the Holy Spirit will come. And when the Lord Jesus Christ sent the Holy Ghost into this world, he sent him from heaven as an apostle with the power and unction of the resurrected Christ. Everything that we do today or believe is based upon what he accomplished at the cross at Calvary when our Lord Jesus Christ died. Amen. Amen. There is no way that you can divorce a Christian from Christ. You cannot divorce a Christian from the Holy Spirit and his ministry. So I'm going to preach you a message this morning about miracles. A lot of things today are considered to be miracles that aren't really miracles. But there are things that happen that I have witnessed in my few years on this earth that are without question are absolute miracles at the hand of God. There is no other way to explain it but the fact that it be a miracle. Just a few days ago, we had a man come down the front of this church and I anointed him with oil right here. He had lung cancer. And of course, having lung cancer is not a very good diagnosis. And he was told that he had lung cancer. Well, just a couple of days ago, his brother called me and said, Preacher, he said, my brother doesn't have lung cancer anymore. It's gone. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's gone, preacher. And he said, he said, they're trying to figure out what happened. Well, I can tell you what happened. They didn't learn it in med school. They, didn't, they can't see it under a microscope. It's not part of their books and theology. But I'll tell you what happened. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, healed that man. 
He healed him. And a miracle, that is a real, genuine miracle that took place. And you better believe that from the rest of the time I've got on this earth, I'm going to let folks know about it. Because God gets the glory. He's sanctified. He's set apart in the sight of all men that God performed a miracle. If he performed a miracle on that man, he can perform a miracle on you. What he did for him, he can do for you. God is no respecter of persons. This man that was anointed with oil, his, he was here praying. His wife was over there praying is a genuine, sincere believer in our Lord Jesus Christ, a man that loves our Lord Jesus Christ, whose life is dedicated to Christ. And when this happened in his life, it came upon them out of nowhere, and he was diagnosed with lung cancer. Now it is gone. I would that the skeptics, the agnostics, and the atheists, and all of the proud and arrogant crowd that talk about the believer as if he was some kind of a hillbilly from the backwoods out here that knows nothing, I would that they would give me a few answers because I have some questions. What happened to this man? Medical science did not do that. That was done by the power of Almighty God. I believe in miracles. You better believe I do. And I believe in healing. I believe that healing is part of the atonement. I believe when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and bowed his head and said, Father, it's finished, the healing of your body was also part of what was finished. The Bible said that by his stripes we were healed. Amen. Therefore, when I pray for someone, I put my hand on their head, and God told me to do that a few months back. He said, now when I was in my closet one night, I was praying and calling upon God. He said, I'm going to tell you what to do. He said, I want you to take both of your hands and I want you to lay them right on top of the head of that one that you're praying for. And I want you to call upon me and ask me to heal him. I want you to call upon my name and pray. That healing power comes into that body. And you say, preacher, that's not what Baptists believe. I believe in the healing of power of God. We'll let God make the decision as to who's healed and who's not. That's his call to make, not mine. My job as a messenger is to bring you before the Lord and cry out for God to do it. Let me tell you something. When the Lord Jesus Christ was at the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Father, if it be thy will, take this cup from me. Remove it from me. Lord, take it from me three times he prayed that but it was not the will of God to remove it and so he bore it at the cross and went through what God wanted him to go through but folks it was not until after Christ had called upon the father to remove that thing and then he accepted the will of the almighty that's what we do we don't take the word of a doctor as the final word. We don't take the word of man as the final word. The final word is the word that comes down from heaven when God Almighty lets you know without a question that this one is going to live or not live. When the Lord Jesus Christ went to the tomb of Lazarus, John chapter number 11, he had said to them in John chapter number 11 and verse number 4, this sickness is not unto death. But when he got there, Lazarus was lying dead in the grave. Some sicknesses are unto death. What's that mean? That means they're not coming back in this world. That means that they're going on. That means that God's perfect will is for them to leave here and go out into the presence of God. That's God's call. But the Lord Jesus Christ went to that tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible said, he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot. It was at the voice of life. The Lord Jesus Christ is the living one. Life produces life. There was no life in that dead body. The life was in the word that went forth out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he spoke, Lazarus come forth, he that was dead came forth. If God speaks to you and says, I will heal you, then my dear friend, he will heal you. That's what's going to happen. So I pray that if you get anything out of this message this morning, I pray that you get this simple truth. You live or you die by the word of God. You live or you die by the will of God. You live or you die by that thing that is called faith. It is that part that you can't reach out and touch. You can't put it under a microscope. You can't dissect it. It is either real or not real. But if it is real, it opens doors. You see new worlds. It brings the power of God down upon your soul. If it is real faith, there is no end. There is no limit. There is nothing that can control real faith in the Lord God Almighty. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James told us that. 
He said, if there be any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. That Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Effectual because you know how to pray. You know what to pray for. You know what to say to God. You understand the will of God. You understand the promises of Scripture. You understand the atonement. That is the effectual prayer. The fervent prayer is that one who would lay all night long if necessary, would go without food if necessary, until you know that you know that you know you got a hold of God. You say, how can you know that, preacher? You'll know it when it happens. You'll know it when it happens. You'll know it when it happens. You won't need somebody to tell you. Just like you don't need somebody to tell you if you're saved. I don't need to ask you if I'm saved. I don't need any church's approval to tell me I'm saved. I don't need any synod, any religion to come along and say I'm saved. I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I know that I passed from death unto life. I know darkness and I know light. Hallelujah to God. And I do not need man's approval. It is the same thing. You'll know it. You'll know it when you get a hold of him. And then you'll know it when he gets a hold of you. And you'll know it when there's a straight line of communication, communion between you and Almighty God. I don't know how many people down through the years have said, Preacher Lawson, God's going to heal me. Preacher Lawson, he told me he was going to heal me. Do you know what I say to them? Hallelujah. Thank God. Praise the Lord. And let God do what he said he's going to do. And I leave it into the hands of God and his servant. Now, Federer, if it, when it happens to you, some of you in here, your healing and your, thought, your thoughts of miracles are theoretical. It's all about this, the arguments that are made, blah, blah, blah. That means nothing. Wait until you are in a valley that you can't even see the sides of. And you don't even see the sun. And you don't feel anything. And more doubt floods your soul than you could ever imagine. And your very faith is put to the test. And you wonder if God has forsaken you. And you wonder what has happened to you all of a sudden overnight. Wait until you are there, and then you begin to understand the one, my dear friend, who said, I'll never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You'll learn something about God in a valley you'll never get on a mountaintop. You'll learn something about God in circumstances that are beyond your control that you'll never learn any other way. And let me tell you, it is that experiential relationship. It is the things that you learn personally between you and God that build your faith. That becomes the foundation of your faith. That is what strengthens you in the Lord. That's what you hold on to. That's what you come back to. That's what makes all the difference in who you are. It's where you say, I know what I don't know what you know, but I know. I don't know where you've been, but I know where I've been. I don't know what you believe, but I know what I believe. I don't know what God's done for you, but I know what he's done for me. I don't know what your church teaches, but I know my life. And I know where he was. And I know what a hole I was in. And I thank God he came to that hole. And he pulled me right out of it. God healed me when they gave me a death sentence. And the doctor said there's nothing that can be done for me. But I want you to know right now. I am here because God has healed me. You'll know that. You'll know that. You'll know that when the time comes. And let me tell you something. Let me give you a word of encouragement this morning. When the time does come, he'll be there as he said he always would be. He'll be there. He'll never leave thee, nor will he ever forsake thee. So miracles should be a part of a Christian's life just as much as your salvation is a part of your life. And it is the hands of Almighty God whether you live or die. Your breath is in his hands. Your heart beats because he tells it to beat. You're alive because he's alive. Everything we are or if we're to be is my friend in the hands of Almighty God. Amen. Do you really believe that? Do you really, really, really believe that it's in the hands of Almighty God? It is, my dear friend. It is. Now, you should look at a few things. The Lord Jesus Christ performed miracles. He had authority over natural forces. What do you mean by that? He could walk on water. And after he walked on water, they said this to him, what manner of man is this? 
that even the seas and the wind obey what he says. I don't know if I can really tell you what manner of man he is, but he's above and beyond all that I could ask or think. Amen. Notice what else he could do. He had authority over the spirit world. In Luke chapter number 4, verse number 34, he directly communicates with demons. And the demons, let it, they, they cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee whom thou art, the Holy One of God. Are you having trouble with demons? I get all kinds of emails from people and they begin, they go into detail about the demonic influences in their lives. It is, I think, an epidemic in this country. And the reason I think it is an epidemic in this country is because of the wickedness of America. America America is a wicked place. You live in the midst of a hell hole, dear friend. And these ungodly, wicked spirits, the demonic spirits, are everywhere you turn. And they're coming after you. They want to destroy your family. They want to destroy you. They want to take all your joy away. They want to inhabit your body. And they want to rob you of the power of God. They're there. They're real. And you've got to learn how to deal with them. They knew Christ. They knew when he approached them that it wasn't good for them. They knew that when the Lord Jesus Christ came to where they were, things were never going to be the same again. They knew who he was. Do you realize that a demon's a lot smarter than you are? How many people do you know that don't even know who Jesus Christ is? I know who he is. Do you know who he is? Sure you do. But there's an awful lot of them out there that don't know who he is. But the demons do. They know exactly. Matthew chapter number 8 and verse number 28. They cried out and said, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? That's a good question because they got nothing to do with him. Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Boy, we get into eschatology and theology here. And of course it's real. For the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who sits in judgment upon all creation. Yes, yes, yes. He had authority over the spirit world. He has authority over sickness and affliction. He healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law. The first pope had a wife, by the way. I mean, Joel stunned that. He healed the woman with the issue of blood. He healed her. The man with a shriveled hand, he healed him. And then the poor leper. God bless you, the poor leper. The one cast out of society, cast away from his family. I can't help but believe that sometimes at night, the old leper would wrap himself up in his rags and he'd come up near to the home and he'd look into the light and see his wife and his children. But he could never go in there to be with him. He was a castaway. He was cast out. Oh, what a curse to have to live like that. Do you know that's what's sin will do to you. Do you understand that men? You can mess around and the time will come when your wife and your children will be in the home and you'll be out here in some hell hole somewhere. You're watching too much TV. You're listening to too much Hollywood. It'll destroy your home. Amen. You see there's spiritual leprosy and physical leprosy. Spiritual leprosy is worse than physical. It's a dying living, dying death. That's what leprosy is. You ought to see some of the films that Tommy Tillman shows I mean, have you ever seen the lepers that Tommy Tillman shows us when he comes from Thailand? The most pitiful sight you ever saw in your life is to see these people over there with half their face eaten away. Hands, just little nubs where fingers used to be. Body wrapped up in rags. What a, what a horrible thing. But he tells the story how that they, they say, Brother, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to the heaven. I'm going to be in heaven. And I'm going to have a new body. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. I'll have a new body. Don't we have a song over here that says that? He has authority over death. The Bible said in Luke chapter number 7, He came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still, and said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. This was the only son of his mother, and they were carrying the casket. This was a funeral procession, a funeral procession. You see, my dear friend, if you got dead bodies and dead people in funeral processions, don't bring them around Christ. <laughs> He just doesn't fit in. Amen. That is wrong place. Big mistake. Because he never killed anybody. He's the Lord of life. And every dead body he ever got around got raised up from the dead. If he ever gets around your dead soul, he'll raise you up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By the way, if you didn't know it, 1973, he raised my dead soul. Amen. But the Bible says in the book of Psalm, chapter number 78, verse 41, listen carefully to this. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. 
That Hebrew word translated limited there is tawa. That's a verb. And it means to pain or wound or grieve. In other words, the word translated limited, the basic root meaning of it is they grieved the very soul of God when they turned back. There at Kadesh Barnea, they could have gone in and taken the land in Hebron. But instead, it by call because of unbelief, which is ever nags us. It's like a yelping dog at your feet. It follows you everywhere you go. Unbelief is a horrible, horrible thing that robs you of the power of God. Their unbelief would not let them go into the land. And my friend, God didn't rejoice because of that. He doesn't rejoice over your unfaithfulness. He doesn't rejoice because you don't believe. The Bible says that if we deny him, he'll deny us. But the Bible said if we believe not... He remaineth faithful. He cannot deny himself. What a beautiful scripture. Amen. You deny him outright and say, I don't know him. Okay, he won't force himself on you. But if your faith begins to waver and fall, he cannot deny himself. Amen. (laughs) Say, how do you stand, preacher? I don't stand. He holds me up. (laughs) Amen. How many of you know what it means to be held up? Somebody to pick you up when you know you're falling. You know you're sinking. You know you're just not going to make it. Yet the something comes along and picks you up and bears you up, gives you power, and the old joy comes back again. And you're praising God. Amen. That's our, that's our human experience. One minute we're down on the floor. Lord God, where are you? I'm crying, pouring my heart out. What happened to you? What's all this problem? Next minute he comes up on your soul and pours the Holy Ghost out on you and you say, Hallelujah to God. Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. Psalm chapter number 78. Read it when you get home. The whole 78th Psalm. It's a history of Israel takes them all the way back to the beginning and carries them through and shows, shows you how all the places they failed, the opportunities that were given. The 78th Psalm, but the Bible says they limited the Holy One of Israel. That's awful to limit God. Amen. Hey man, no big deal limit me. I have limitations. I know some of them. One of the best things you'll ever learn in your life is to learn your limitations. But limit God? You can't limit God except through unbelief. Unbelief is a weapon you can use on God that will stay his hand. John chapter number 2, verse 23, verses 23 and 24. Listen to this. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. What's this mean? It means that he understood superficial faith when he saw it. They got caught up in the moment. They felt good about the circumstances. Something seemed like it was being an answer to prayer. They felt like, boy, I've done one the victory. Superficial faith, shallow as it can be. But anytime the trying time comes, then they don't have no root and they come falling down. He, in other words, he said he did not commit himself to them. It's hard, but we can do it. To cast yourself upon the Lord. To come under the shadow of his wings. You remember what Naomi said to Ruth when she'd gone off into Moab? She said, you've chosen my God. And you've chosen to put yourself under his wings. Well, that's a beautiful thing. Ruth had no knowledge of God apart from what she knew from Naomi. She had no knowledge of God over there in Moab. She was like the Syrophoenician woman. She was like any of the pagans of those days. They knew nothing about God. All they might have known, maybe it's what somebody might have said to them personally, but they had no theology. They had no Bible. And yet Ruth, with what little bit of light she had, she said, your God's going to be my God. And your people are going to be my people. Where thou livest, I will live. Where thou abidest, I will abide. And where thou diest, I will die. Nothing will separate the two of us. The Almighty smelled a sweet savor, spread his wing over her, said, that's what you want, Ruth. That's what you can have. You can make the same decision this morning. You can choose the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our Lord Jesus Christ. And boy, I'll tell you right now, when he died at the cross, he died. Your name was one of them that was mentioned. And he'll take that big wing and he'll spread it over you. And he'll pull you in next to him. Put him in the shadow. The Bible said, he knoweth them who put their trust in him. I don't know anything else. I don't know what to say to you this morning than to say that there's nothing you can do for God any greater than trust him. (laughs) 
I mean, you can work your fingers to the bone. You can sacrifice your own blood. You can give every dime you got. But there's nothing you can do for God that's greater than trusting him. Because when you trust him, you've cast yourself upon his character. You're saying, I may not understand a lot about you. There's a whole lot I just don't know about. But there's one thing about it. What little I know, I love you. I'm going to trust you. My life is in your hands. And he'll smell a sweet savor. And he'll spread his wing over you. And he'll take you in. That's a wonderful thing. And we can do that. You can do that today. You might have walked in this house this morning full of doubt, full of questions, full of misunderstandings. Satan had been working you over. He's good at that area, believe me. Amen. Once you start doubting, once you have questions, once, once your faith begins to falter, or fail just a little bit, here comes Satan just like that. Man, he's right there jotting on the spot. He's got an answer for every problem. He's got an answer for all your doubts. But every one of them is going to lead you astray. He's going to lead you away from the Lord. He's a liar and a deceiver. What's from the beginning still is to this day. Trust in him. Trust in him. And you'll never go wrong. You'll never, ever go wrong. This Bible says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Come down off of your high horse. Let some humility begin to develop in your soul. Now notice carefully it said faults. It's not, this, this, listen, let me tell you something. Don't ever get up in front of a church and go through a litany of everything you've done. Don't name all the women you've been chasing and all the men you've been chasing and all the stuff you've been out here doing and dragging a bunch of people's names through the mud and get up in front of people and start telling them because you're telling the world. And believe me, the world out there wants to hear it. They'll grab it and they'll run with it. And they'll beat you to death with it for the rest of your life. Confess your faults. In other words, I'm weak in faith. I've got a temper. I've got problems. I heard a preacher say something this morning on TV. Early this morning, I was still drinking my coffee and trying to wake up. By the way, that CPAP's working good. Man, I sleep in six and seven hours a night. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> Hey, everybody ought to get you a CPAP. That'll fix you up, boy. <laughs> here I am. <laughs> I'm watching this thing, and here, this, here this, this brother gets up, and he starts quoting the book of Philippians. And when I tuned in, that's where he was, about halfway through Philippians. He quoted the whole book of Philippians, went from the front to the back. And then he started preaching his message, and then he'd get back into quoting long passages of Scripture, and I thought, man, this guy's done some work. But he got to the end of his message and said this, and this is so important because this will help some of you because it helped me. He got to the end of his message and he said this. He said, I was raised in Chicago, Illinois. He said, I was one of eight children. He said, I was one of eight children. He said, my father abused us physically and sexually. He said, I was the oldest. He said, by the time I was 11 years old, he had me on the street selling myself, prostituting me. He said, there's scars so run so deep inside me. He said, I don't even understand them myself. They're so deep, hurt so deeply. He said, other people can come and hug you, you know, and show Christian love and affection. He said, but they can't hug me. I can't, I can't, I can't have it. I can't, I can't, I can't endure it. I can't endure the hugging. He said, I'm not married. He said, it messed me up so bad that I'm not even married to this day. I can't marry somebody. I just, I'm so messed up. He said, but I know my Lord loves me. And he came to me and he saved me. And he said, I've given him my life and, and this is what I live for and this is what I love to do. He said, this is, this, this is me. This is who I am. You can accept me for who I am or you can try to put a rubber stamp on me and a cookie cutter and make me just, you know, everybody looks the same, sounds the same. That's not what we're about. Some of you got messed with when you were young. Some of you have been out there in places you should have never gone to. Some of you have scars in your soul that you don't get rid of overnight. You may never get rid of them. You might have had things done to you by people that, 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 you, that you trusted. There's nothing more confusing than for a parent to mess with their own children. Because the natural inclination for a child is to love its parent. But when that happens to them, they're all messed up. They're all messed up. They have all of these conflicting feelings. Then maybe that's you. The church is not about some pretty little sweet-smelling, sweet-talking little Christian. The church is about saved people that God is sanctifying and drawing close to him through his word. And we learn when we begin to mature 
that we're not all the same. Some of us have strengths the others don't have. Some have, some have, some have vulnerabilities the others don't have. And we learn to live with that. And we learn to appreciate the fact that regardless of what our certain circumstance is, God still loves us. And we ought to love each other. This is what he's talking about. Love each other. And this brother blessed my soul. Because I said to myself, now brother, nobody prostituted me when I was 11 years old. And I never was physically molested sexually or physically by anybody in my family. Thank God. But I'll tell you right now, I had a lot of things happen to me when I was young. Stuff that you'll never hear me tell you. I've only told you part of what I had when I grew up. When I grew up. Just part. Just part. Just part. God only knows the stuff that I had to see and live with. And when he said that, I said, now, brother, I have the same thing. I'm 70 years old and I still have things that are just not right. Things that have happened to me. Things that, you know, I just, I don't respond the, the way that you normally would. And it's in the flesh. It's not in my spirit. But I wish you'd show me how you could live without being in your flesh until God calls you out of here. Your flesh is a powerful thing. And your fleshly mind is a memory bank that's going to stay with you. So what do you do, preacher? I step back and say, thank you, Lord. Doesn't matter what happened to me. You called me in 1973, and you saved my soul and wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you gave me something to live for. And I know I'm not what I used to be. And hallelujah to God. It doesn't make any difference how much garbage, baggage, bones in the closet. It doesn't matter. I know whom I have believed. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why I have such a heart for children. I love children. Because when I was a child, I was so vulnerable. I love these little, beautiful little children. You ever look at these little kids we got running around here? Beautiful little children. Little old precious thing. Big eyes. Little old heart. Little, little beautiful little children. I love these little children. Love them. I love them. But they're vulnerable. They're vulnerable. And when I was vulnerable, that's when it happened to me. Did that help you? Some of you are fighting that. You're dealing with that. You're wondering about that. Well, let me tell you something. If any man comes unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. He's no respecter of persons. Amen. Hallelujah. No respecter. He doesn't care who you are. He doesn't care what you look like. He doesn't care how much money you got in the bank. He doesn't care whether you're a big shot, medium shot, or a little shot. It doesn't matter to him. If you come to him, he won't cast you out. Now, I got about halfway through my message, but I'm done. Because this is what God wanted me to say. There's somebody in here this morning this was for. You're broken. You don't know which way to go. You don't know what to do. You feel like you're an utter failure, second-class Christian, trodden down. And that some, some so-called Christians will reinforce that. But that's a bunch of garbage. The ground at the level at the foot of the cross is just as level as it can be. <laughs> Ain't nobody any blinder than God when it comes to that cross. Come, 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 and take of the water of life freely. Wherever, whoever, whatever you are, come to him this morning. He'll heal you. He'll cleanse you, and he'll forgive you because he'll work a miracle in your life. I'm going to give you this, and I'll shut up. I was reading a story about the old farmer and his mule. The old farmer went out and dug him a hole in the ground. I don't know what he dug the hole for, but he had him a big hole out there. All right. Well, his prized mule fell in that hole. Yep. Farmer walking up the side of the hole and he looked down, there's his mule. Now, mules can weigh quite a bit. Farmer said to himself, how in the world am I going to get this mule out of here? Can't get him out. He's too heavy. And he didn't want him to stay down there and, dry, and, and starve to death. So he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. The most humane thing to do is just bury him. So he started digging up the dirt and throwing it on top of that mule. Another shovel load of dirt on top of that mule. More dirt on the mule. Every time he'd throw dirt on that mule, that old mule would shake himself. Shake it off of him. Well, it didn't take too long throwing that dirt on top of that mule and the mule shaking it off of him. The ground started rising. <laughs> Finally, the last shovel load of dirt he threw on top of that old mule. The old mule took a step. <laughs> right out of that hole. <laughs> How 
How much dirt Satan throwing on you? Somewhere along the line, take that step. Say, I'm done with this. Enough of this. I want out of this hole. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your holy word now. Thank you, Father. Once again, this messenger had the privilege, the great privilege. Hallelujah to God. Bless your name. The great privilege, Lord, to stand up and preach it. Now, Father, it's in the word now. It's not me. It's in the word. What's the word going to do? I pray about that now and the altar call we're going to give for those that heard it to receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Let's stand up this morning.